Hello, and welcome back to another edition of the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. My name is Jeremy Howard, and I am the pastor of Orchard Hills Bible Church in Payson, Utah. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me today. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, you will uh, see something in the Word of God today that provokes your thinking and uh, encourages your heart. Well, let's uh, just jump right into it. It's Second Samuel that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is looking at this week, uh, going through the Old Testament week by week. It's technically, <clears throat> let's see, 2 Samuel 5 through 7, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, and then 1 Kings 3, 8, and 11. <laughs> well, we are just going to be looking at 2 Samuel, and then uh, the next episode for next week we'll be looking at 1 Kings. But in 2 Samuel 7... Uh, which we're not going to spend time in together for our purposes, but Second Samuel 7, you have God communicating to David a covenant, and this is also repeated in Psalm 89. So Second Samuel 7 and Psalm 89, you could read those two together. They go together. And God has made a promise to David that, uh, that this is called the Davidic covenant uh, in most theological circles, that he is going to give David a house, he's going to give David a kingdom, and a throne. And David will never lack a descendant to sit on the throne. And there's so many interesting things to explore there with how Jesus fulfills that uh, promise, and how in the future, the future Messianic kingdom that will be explicitly expressed on the face of the earth, how the... uh, elements of that covenant will come to total fulfillment and fruition. But for our purposes today, I want us to consider 2 Samuel 11, which is a pretty famous chapter. It has to do with the incident with Bathsheba. So 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll just start at verse 1 together. It says, Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, Rabbah, Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. So David is just dominating in the, uh, the realm of war and battle. But here is a, a major sin in his life. Let's check it out. Verse 2. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house, And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. Now up until this point, let's just stop right here. Up until this point, David hasn't sinned. He's up on his roof, he's walking around. We have no evidence in the text here that he's done anything wrong. Even looks across, sees a woman bathing and she's beautiful. That's not sinful. Now, did he, if if he had a godly heart, and was desiring to live righteously, would he have wanted to see that? No, he he wouldn't have. Okay, But whether you want to see something or not, the fact that you just see it, that's not sinful. I mean, you're looking around and, whoa, there's something I didn't want to see. Or in this case, we're about to find out that's something that David did want to see. And now we're going to see David's sinful response to what came across his vision. It says in verse 3, So David sent and inquired about the woman. All right. Recognizing that she's a beautiful woman and she's bathing, is that sinful? No. Sending your men out and inquiring about the woman because you have a sinful motivation, is that sinful? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, one of his uh, men said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Now, there have been some people recently, it's kind of interesting, who have tried to make this out to uh, a rape scenario that David raped her. That's not what the text says. The Old Testament had words to describe that type of situation, and uh, you can read about that in the law. 
And there's nothing here that indicates it was by force. It's, hey, the king of Israel sent for her, and uh, she seemed pretty willing. They, they slept together, and uh, this was intentional. This was cooperative. This was obviously adultery. David was married at this point, uh, and here we have Bathsheba. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She's married. This is an affair, you could say, but this is the sin of adultery, okay? To cut through all the language we might want to use, this is the sin of adultery. All right, well, uh, what do you do when you commit adultery if you're a godly person desiring to please and honor God? Because just because you're a, a godly person, someone who's living a life uh, in a Godward direction, that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. There are people who fall into sin, who stumble and fall, sometimes into grievous sin, like adultery. I'm not here to say, you know, adultery is a, a light thing. Adultery is not like saying a swear word when you hit your thumb with a, with a hammer. And that's not the same as, you know, some, some other things, like not reading your Bible for two weeks, okay, no, because you don't want to hear from God. Um, sins are all, kind of, uh, all kinds of varying levels, and adultery is very serious, okay? At the same time, just because someone commits adultery, that does not mean that that person is hell-bound. That doesn't mean that that person is lost forever. That doesn't mean that that person is a lost cause or, or damned on the spot. It doesn't mean any of those things. And when a person who is a member of God's household, someone who has been born again, someone who's been saved by God, someone who's been added to God's family, when that person commits a sin, even a grievous, deep, far-reaching effects type of sin like adultery, what should that person do? The answer is, number one, repent. And number two, make things right with the people involved, okay? So it's going to God, confessing the sin, and asking for forgiveness. That's repentance. That's what repentance is. The second element of that is to make things right with the people involved. And, and that, boy, in this case like adultery, that can get very awkward, uncomfortable, and it does have extreme ramifications, just naturally. Well, let's see what David does. Let's uh, go back to the text here and, and read, starting in verse 6. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present from the king was sent out after him. So now have this in your mind. You have these two men meeting. David just committed adultery with this other man's wife, and he's bringing him in and just chatting with him. It's pretty sick and twisted stuff, isn't it? Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 9, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat? And to drink, sorry, I read that a little wrong. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. He's a selfless man. He's wanting to, to be a team player here. Verse 12, then David said to Uriah, stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next now David called him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his Lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. So what's David doing here? What is David doing with Uriah? Well, we can say, first, David is not repenting. He's not ask, confessing his sin to God. He's not asking for forgiveness. He's not 
turned in any sense. He's not making things right with Uriah. He's not making things right with Bathsheba. He's not making things right with his own household. He is uh, he's making things worse. That's what David's doing. We could say he's making things worse. Well, we need to keep reading uh, to see what else he does. Verse 14. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. This is, uh, this is now how David is going to deal with his sin. He's avoiding repentance. He's avoiding confession. He's avoiding making things right with those he sinned against. He's going to press deeper and deeper into sin, trying to use sin as a cover for sin. And again, I've talked about it so much in this series, if you've been listening along, this is pragmatism. Are you, are you spotting it now? This is pragmatism. God's way says, repent and make things right. Man says, well, <clears throat> that hurts my pride. I don't want to do that. There's got to be another way. And so here David is finding another way instead of going through all of the, the discomfort of confessing sin openly and changing. How about I just kill off Uriah? If Uriah was dead, then my life would be better. Everything would be better. But you see, Uriah is not the problem here, is he? Uriah isn't the problem. David's the problem. Bathsheba's the problem. Uriah's not the problem. So you kill Uriah, the problem's still there. This is important for you to, to spot. So he tells Joab, go put Uriah in the front line in the fiercest battle so that he will die. He's telling Joab, his commander, I'm specifically ordering this so that Uriah will die. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. So it was, as Joab kept watch on the city, that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab, and some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. He charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it, it, it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech, the son of... Boy, that's quite the name. We'll just say Abimelech. Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? So when people question the strategy, then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Verse 22, so the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, but we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall, so some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger, and overthrow it, and so encourage him. Now when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son." But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. <sighs> so after this battle where Uriah dies, you know, that Joab and the gang there to report what happened. And uh, as they go back and say, hey, we had lots of men die in battle today. We were, we were near the wall of the city and the people were on top of the wall and they were killing off our guys. Of course, the king's response is going to be, hey, you big dummy, why did you do that? We just lost a bunch of our valiant men. Remember the text said these were valiant men on the front line. Why would you put our valiant men in danger like that so that we would suffer loss? No, 
no commander, no strategist worth his weight in salt would do such a thing. But then when David hears, well, Uriah is also dead. Now David says, oh, okay, okay, well, it was worth it. These men who lost their lives, to David, it was worth it so that his sin would be covered. Put, them, put the whole front line in harm's way. We can't make it look like we're just singling out Uriah, so other, other men have to die too. Gross sin, isn't it? This is gross sin. And sin so often has far-reaching effects. You go back to Achan in the book of Judges, when Achan had taken some of the devoted things, those things that were supposed to be devoted to destruction, when he took them for himself and he hid them in his tent, remember there were men who died in battle because the Lord was not blessing them in battle because of Achan's sin. The whole group was affected because of Achan's sin. And remember, he, whether it was because he got his sons and daughters involved in his own sin and they were guilty of sin or, or whether it was something else, Achan's sons and daughters died with him. So, uh, sin really affects more than we, we, we often think. And when we try to cover sin with sin, we just compound the issue. We just make it worse. And that's what happened with David. He, he's just making it worse. Now, this is not the end of that story, thankfully. So thankful that's not the end of the story. I want to show you Psalm 51. And you can see if you're watching along. It says, this is a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So later on in David's life, God sends Nathan the prophet. And uh, <clears throat> Nathan gives, basically lets David know that he needs to repent. He confronts David in his sin. God uses Nathan to confront David. And David, at this point, repents. So let's, let's read the Psalm of Repentance real quick. Let, let's, let's check it out. Psalm 51, verse 5, or Psalm 51, verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Let's stop right there. If you were God and you had witnessed David do all the things that he did in 2 Samuel 11, would you be gracious? Would you have compassion? Does David deserve it? Think about this. And this is another one of those instances where I want you to see how different God's nature is from our nature. How, how different God is from man. God is gracious. He's ready to forgive. He's abounding in loving kindness. He overflows with compassion. And even after all these things that David did that were so wrong, plainly evil in the sight of the Lord, worthy of death, worthy of condemnation, worthy of total judgment, David comes to God and he asks him this, and, and, and I think maybe some of you might have a reaction when you hear this, like, oh, David, you can't be serious. David, there's no way you should be coming back to God asking for grace or asking for compassion. Look at what you did. You deserve to pay. You have to make this up somehow, David. For David to come back and say, again, verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. For some of you, you look at that and you say, No, you don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. But recognize here what specifically David is saying. Be gracious to me, O God, according to my works? No. If that were the case, we, we would all join together and say, Are you serious, David? But he says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. He's appealing 
to a virtue that is outside of himself. He is not appealing to, appealing to his own virtues as the basis for grace. He's appealing to God's virtue of loving kindness as the basis for grace. And again, he says, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. He doesn't say, according to the scales that show that my good works outweigh my bad, let me into heaven and just dismiss all my evil deeds. That is not his argument. That's not his appeal. That's not what he's relying on. He relies totally, he appeals totally to the greatness of God's compassion, relying 100% on the virtue of God, the character of God, the nature of God, that his transgressions would be forgiven. We're learning something here about the gospel, aren't we? He goes on to say, verse 2, "'Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin.'" For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What's he saying here? He's saying this is nothing new. I was born a sinner from conception. Sin has had an impact on me. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. How does David get to the point in this confession, in this psalm of confession? How does he get to the point where he's talking about teaching other sinners and leading them to God, teaching them in the ways of God, when he's a, an adulterous murderer? How, what business does he have talking about teaching other people? Well, this says something about how comprehensive and impactful and how enabling the forgiveness of God is. God's mercy, his compassion, his love, his forgiveness, his grace is so amazing that when David asks God to forgive him, to purify him, to wash him so that he will be whiter than snow, that God actually does it. Now just sit there and and think about that for a moment. When a sinner comes to God, understanding who God is, and appeals to the eternal love of God and compassion of God, appeals only to that, and asks God to purify him. God will purify that sinner. And now it's through the cross of Christ. It's not just that we have this general idea Uh, that God is merciful and compassionate, but that mercy and compassion actually was made manifest in the flesh among us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, because Jesus has come and he has died on the cross in our place for our sins, paying the penalty that we deserve, taking the death that we deserve for our sin— And he rose again. He took his own life up again, 
proving that he is who he said he was. Our sin has been taken care of and righteousness is offered to us if we appeal to what Jesus has done. If we, again, look outside of ourselves and rely wholly, totally on the work of Jesus, on the character and nature of God that is unlike man, totally unlike man. Then on the basis of faith, and the, that's what that appeal is, that's faith, on the basis of that, we are forgiven and we are made whiter than snow. We are purified totally. We are washed. We are cleansed. All of our sin has gone away and the very righteousness of God is placed on our account. That God would, would never stand over us in condemnation or judgment. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we can be totally released, totally free from all that judgment because of what God has done for us. Even if you have committed adultery, even if you have murdered somebody, think of the worst sins that you think should keep someone out of heaven forever, that the the door would be locked and the key is thrown away. Even if you have done those things, God will be merciful to you if you come to him in faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, that was in a different dispensation. That was at a time where the Holy Spirit did come and go uh, among men. But now, in the new covenant, now that Jesus has come and he's building his church, the church is the temple of the Spirit, and individually, every Christian is a temple of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us. In fact, Jesus said that he's sending this this comforter for us. He is coming to us to guide us and counsel us. And Jesus said that it is through the Holy Spirit's ministry that even the Father and the Son make their abode in the heart of the repentant sinner, the one who is born again. The Father and the Son are with him through the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he dwells within. And we don't have to pray Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. If we're Christians, we always have the Holy Spirit comforting us. He's assuring us that we are children of God. He's testifying with our spirit. He's bringing forth fruit. He's convicting us of sin. He's guiding us into all righteousness. He's helping us understand the Word of God, and He brings us closer to God through the gospel. Isn't this amazing how loving God is? Well, uh, I hope you got something from this lesson today. I know it's a little bit longer, but uh, how could it not be a a longer (laughs) episode when we're talking about something as marvelous as David being utterly cleansed from sin and being restored to God even after such damnable and evil actions? Well, I hope that you are understanding more about the gospel, and if you are not a believer in the gospel, I sincerely hope that you will come to faith in Jesus Christ, a true saving faith, that you will come to know him, love him, live for him all of your days, to fear God and to walk with God in wisdom and in holiness. That's what God desires, and it's on the basis of faith and appeal to his nature, not an appeal to our own works or an appeal to what we could do to make up for the things that we've done that are wrong. Thank you so much for listening. Please reach out. If there's anything I can do for you, I'd love to be a help. See you next time.